to celebrate the power, the audacity, and the necessary governance of young women in our culture, especially young women of color who've been fighting these battles for far too long. Kate Schatz and illustrator Miriam Kleinstahl are illuminating these women in their series of short biographies, Rad American Women A to Z, Rad Women Worldwide, and their newest, just published this summer, in which we're celebrating tonight, Rad Girls Ken. Kate hails from the Bay Area where she writes, teaches, speaks, and resists. She's the co-founder of Solidarity Sundays, a nationwide network of feminist activist groups of which there is a member group in Montpelier, and which is how Kate and I initially connected. As an educator, Kate has worked with a wide range of age groups for over 15 years. She taught women's studies, literature, and creative writing at UC Santa Cruz, San Jose State, Rhode Island College, and Brown University. She developed and led creative writing workshops for middle school students as part of Ailey Camp, a youth program run by the Ailey, Alvin Ailey Foundation. And she's the former chair of the School of Literary Arts at Oakland School for the Arts, where she taught fiction, poetry, and journalism to 9th to, nine to 12th graders for many years. Now she shares the Rad Women books with students ranging from K through college on a regular basis. Kate has brought some very special guests with her, whom she will introduce very soon. But first, before we go any further, I'd like to invite a very intelligent and savvy rad girl who lives amongst us up to the podium, <coughs> or not podium, depending on what you want to do. Hope Petraro is a junior at Montpelier High School who grew up amongst the incredible diversity of New York City. Before moving to our practically all-white state, wanting to integrate the rich culture she grew up in with her new home, she's been working hard along with fellow students to find ways to connect people through encouraging actions and conversations about race and privilege. Hope is the founder of the annual Race Against Racism that's happening this September at Montpelier High School. Thank you for joining us tonight, Hope. Hi, my name is Hope Atrero. I'm 16 years old and I'm becoming a junior at Montpelier High School this fall. I faced trials and tribulations myself, especially as a change maker, not just in politics or social justice, but being in, the, but in being the master of my own destiny. To tell you a little bit about myself, I was raised by a single mother who's gotten her college education while raising me. In New York City, um, a place where culture is really rich and a place that's really, really different from Vermont. <sighs> If you asked me what has had the biggest impact on my life, a few words would come to mind. Socioeconomic status, gender, race. As I've grown older, I've grown more aware of the dynamics of privilege. I've had to grapple a lot with how my own life has been shaped by what I didn't choose, by what I couldn't choose. That applies to everyone in this room. To me, success is the ability to define yourself in spite of this. To understand that circumstance shapes you, but it doesn't have to make or break you. So, my journey to activism has sort of been like ever since I was a kid. I was always trying to um, be the Good Samaritan. I went to Catholic school and um, always like do what I could to help my classmates and my peers. But it didn't really solidify until I moved to Vermont. Um, and. When I did move to Vermont, I sort of suffered from culture shock because it was very, very different from the home I'd grown up in, but it also taught me a lot um, through li living, through having to learn a little bit more about a different culture and a different state. I also learned about how to define myself, not by the place I was raised in or lived in, but by my own beliefs and principles and values. And gradually, I began to wear them like a badge of honor and so when I did move to Vermont, I noticed that my community was very white and that there weren't really conversations on race and diversity. And I felt out of place because I really wanted to start discourse or continue the ongoing discourse in our nation right here. And for a while, I didn't really know what to do. And I sort of just, um, I don't know, I just felt really sad. But then as I 
became more ad um, adjusted to Vermont, I start started to acquaint myself with activist circles and I under started learning more about Vermont politics as well. And it's a great place to live now <laughs> for me. And I um, was told when I first moved here to join a lot of clubs and to volunteer as much as I could. And so upon entering high school, I volunteered, I started volunteering for the Vermont Democratic Party, which I think changed my life a bit because I sort of like knew about politics and political issues, but I never really wanted to acquaint myself with them and to acquaint myself with legislation and policy and um, never knew how I myself could sort of impact my community even as a student. But I made phone calls, I visited people's homes and knocked on doors and I helped set up for rallies and it was November 7th when I realized as the results were coming in, I was in Burlington um, at a Vermont Democratic Party event and I thought to myself, I could be a politician. <laughs> I could do this one day. This is a world I want to be in and I think that's a really powerful thing, especially as a young woman of color in society. And um, I knew that I had to sort of use this as a stepping stone for something more. And so I joined the Racial Justice Alliance at Montpelier High School. And this past year, we were the first public secondary institution to raise the Black Lives Matter flag. <laughs> I also joined activist clubs and climate justice groups at my school and they're all run by youth and it's been an amazing experience and for the Black Lives Matter flag raising we um, show the movie the 13th which is a documentary about racial justice and racial injustice in America today and we um, got the whole school involved for an educational experience and it was something that I had been craving ever since I moved here and to finally get my peers involved and to teach my peers and to have them um, join us in the fight for racial justice was really, really meaningful. And then I decided to found the Race Against Racism, which happened in September of last year and is happening again this year. and. I think it was really eye-opening to have to plan an activist event, but it also uh, helped me get acquainted with activist circles around Vermont, and it was a way for me to make a public statement to my community um, that racial justice is important, and it's right in the Capitol, so we, even politicians could see. And um, we had speakers and performers, and we raised money for migrant justice and justice for all Vermont. And um, I think that over the past two years, how I've grown is because of the moments where I've said, okay, this is what it is, but how can I change it? And so I became a legislative intern, and there's just a lot that I've done, and I've seen the youth around me do a lot of amazing things. Like when people will ask me, Hope, what, what inspires you the most? Who inspires you the most? And the first thing I think of are my peers because every single day they're doing absolutely amazing things, whether it's in sports or activism or the arts. And yeah, I think that sort of um, summarizes my journey to activism in Vermont. And every day I try to be more involved and um, I found a community here, which I think is really, really important, and it's how I've met Muslim Girls Making Change and a lot of great activists and students from around the state. So, yeah, I think that, as I said before, activism has always been a part of me, and I think that activism is... Activism is a seed that's sown from the day you're born because what you fight for is very often what's denied of you. And every single day, it, I know that I'm fighting for something important. And I know that the youth in Vermont and the youth nationwide are fighting for something that's very, very important. And so, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Uh, 
Um, Hope, you probably hear this a lot, but you are very aptly named. Um, thank you so much. There is hope. It's like so cheesy. I feel lame even saying that, but like there really is hope. I, that gave me a lot of hope. And uh, I mean, that's pretty much why we wrote the book that we did, this book, Rad Girls Can, because um, my illustrator, Miriam Kleinstahl, who says hello, she's She's in California, she wishes she could be here. Um, but we know that there are so many incredible stories and there's so much power in youth and that's the, the, the engine behind so many of our amazing movements. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much. You just like made me flash back to my teenage activism so much. I was like phone banking for the Green Party when I was 16, <laughs> long ago. It was like me and a bunch of 80-year-old awesome <laughs> women. <laughs> they were so excited to have me. <laughs> uh, all right, so, um, so my name is Kate Schatz, um, and I'm the author of these books, and I'm super excited to be here um, in Vermont. Um, I was soaking wet in a rainstorm in a lake nearby about an hour ago, um, but I dried off in the car, and my hair is still a little damp, um, but I love swimming in your beautiful lakes uh, in this lovely state. Um, I'm really glad to be here. I've never, this is my first time in your wonderful state capital, so thank you, Mark, for there. Um, I was saying, I was saying to my kids in the car that I think that, uh, you know, I was one of those kids that memorized all the state capitals. And like, that was a big deal. I could recite them over dinner. So I like, I've known about Montpelier forever. <laughs> I know it. My dad would be like, Vermont, like, Montpelier, I got it. Um, um, but uh, so I'm really glad to be here. And I'm mostly excited to be joined um, by some amazing people that you're going to be hearing from. Um, we have your, one of your state representatives, Selena Colburn here. And, <laughs> hey, and we have Balkisa, Lena, and Hawa from the Muslim Girls Making Change. Who are, uh, no big deal, on the cover of our book. Um, yay! Um, which, you know, before, we have a lot to talk about tonight, and we have a lot to go over, um, but I wanted to say about um, your work at your high school and the raising of the Black Lives Matter flag, which is something that I read about in like a CNN viral article, because that went pretty viral after that happened. And actually, I organized our Solidarity Sundays chapters across the country to send letters of support to your school, thanking you guys. Um, so we we have a nice connection there. Um, but like, why does that matter? Why is raising that flag matter, right? Because it's about visibility. I mean, it's about so many things, but part of, and I've actually been doing a lot of TV appearances um, on this book tour, and I've been wearing my Black Lives Matter t-shirt um, on all of my TV appearances because I have a big platform, I'm on TV, I'm gonna wear that t-shirt. Um, because visibility matters, and raising that flag matters, and wearing the t-shirt matters, your bumper stickers matter, <laughs> um, but also we know that the cover of our book matters. So it was really meaningful to us when we talked to our designer. I was like, I wanna put this beautiful image of these young women on the cover of this book. They're looking happy, they're excited, they're young, um, and I wanna have young Muslim women wearing head coverings on the cover of our book looking awesome and happy. And that kind of visibility was important to us um, in our books. It's important to us in the pages of our books. Um, it's important to Miriam, who's not here. Um, but yeah, so thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Um, so this is the third book in the Rad Women series. Um, the first book was Rad American Women A to Z that came out in um, 2015, I think. and. I got the idea for that book when my daughter was about two years old. Um, she is much older than two now. She's upstairs. Is she still upstairs? She's like so done watching my book events. She's just like, <laughs> she's reading Harry Potter upstairs. <laughs> but, uh, but I was thinking um, what about the kind of books that I would want her to read when she was older. What did I want to share with her? What kind of stories and information um, and, and histories did I want her to encounter? And I thought about what kind of books would I have wanted to read when I was a kid. And I loved reading about strong, adventurous, cool women when I was a kid. And at the time, she was two, so we had a lot of A to Z books. It was like A is for apple, and A is for alligator, and uh, it popped into my head. What if I did an A to Z book about women from history? And it kind of went from there. Um, and the idea grew and grew and grew. Finally did it, turned into a book. 
very unexpectedly became a bestseller, um, and it's delightfully taken over my life in a very exciting way. Um, we followed it with Rad Women Worldwide, which tells stories of women from all over the world. Um, and then, again, we followed that with this book, which focuses on 50 stories of girls who have done something remarkable before the age of 20. And the idea for this book really came from our readers. So we do a lot of school visits and assemblies and presentations um, all over the place. And kids love to give us ideas for future books. And they're, sometimes they're like really ridiculous like and silly. Like, you should do a book about rad dogs. And which, so it's not ridiculous. That's a fine idea. Um, but, but the one that we heard the most um, was, can you do a book about girls? Or can you do a book about young people and people my age? And that was actually really intimidating at first um, as, an, as an idea. It's very different to research contemporary young awesome people uh, than it is to research you know, historical figures who have books written about them. And there's scholars who've researched their lives. Even if they're relatively obscure, there's more information out there. Um, but we really realized that that was a book people wanted. And again, as we thought about you know, who really drives change and, and hope and activism in this country. It is young people. Um, and then in the wake of the election, we were like, oh yeah, this is, this is obviously the book that we want to do. And these are the stories we want to tell. I think the hardest thing about uh, creating this book was knowing when to stop, who to include. Um, and you know, we had to stop somewhere, right? But it's like every time I thought I knew exactly who we were going to be writing about, someone would send me an article about some amazing teenager who invented a really cool thing. And I'd be like, no, I want to have her in the book. Um, so that was probably the, 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 the most challenging part. Um, we're going to do a q and I'll do a Q&A at the end. So if you have other questions about all that, I'm happy to, to answer. Um, I am going to start us off. You're going to hear a couple of the stories um, from the book this evening. Um, but they're not all going to be read by me because we have our uh, wonderful guests. So um, I asked. Um, your state representative, Selena Colburn, um, if she would come and be here this evening and choose a story from the book to read. Um, she chose the story that I was hoping she'd choose, which is really <laughs> magical. Um, though when you hear it, like maybe you'll, you'll realize why. So it ties in wonderfully with Hope's realization that maybe she will run for office. Maybe she will. I think so. You know. Uh, I think you'll get a lot of votes from in here. And uh, Selena who is an elected official, is going to read a story about someone else uh, who ran for office. So Selena, I read your amazing bio on the internet, and you've done a lot of incredible things. And I did the terrible thing where I didn't write it all down. Um, but you are a librarian. That's true. You are a dancer, true. a professor of dance, a little bit, a, little bit. Yeah. Uh, a total badass, I hope so. and <laughs> an elected official since 2015 in the fine state of Vermont. And you were born and raised in Burlington. Yes. Right. What did I forget? You, you got it. That's I got really it all? Good. Yeah, Fantastic. There's, one, there's way more things. She's being very humble. Um, all right. Uh, your state representative, Selena Colburn. Do you want the mic or do you want to use politician voice? Uh, I'll try my politician voice. And if it doesn't work, you can tell me and I'll use the mic. Is that yeah. good? I'll just have it. OK. Yes, yeah. I can. I will definitely use the mic, um, and I just want to acknowledge that I I am a rep I represent part of Burlington, but actually your representative, the amazing Kimberly Jessup, who represents um, a much closer, yeah, and serves on the House Judiciary Committee with me, and is also a total badass, is here. I get to be here. I get to be here because I know Miriam Kleinstahl, the illustrator of this book from many decades ago when we lived in San Francisco together as young people. Um, so the story I chose to read is about uh, Mary Pat Hector, and who was born in Atlanta, Georgia in 1997. And I will just read it to you. Mary Pat. Oh, and I'll show you her picture, too, because the pictures in this book are amazing. That's her. Mary Pat Hector's campaign for an open seat on the city council of Stonecrest, Georgia, hadn't even gotten started before someone tried to stop it. 
not because of her political beliefs or some past scandal, but because of her age. An award-winning 19-year-old college sophomore, Mary Pat had years of experience as an activist, youth leader, and public speaker, and was eager to launch her political career. But one of her opponents objected and wrote a letter to the County Board of Elections, arguing that she was just too young to run. And this is a quote from her. The fact that young people all over the country saw me running and knew they could run too, that was the most meaningful part of it. Mary Pat thought this was ridiculous. At age 19, she had the right to vote, but she couldn't be elected to represent her community. She appeared before the board and argued that she should be allowed to run. Her friends and family packed the courtroom and the board ruled unanimously in her favor. Mary Pat could remain on the ballot. Mary Pat and her team, who were all college students, amazing, worked hard on her campaign. They knocked on doors, handed out flyers, and made phone calls to voters. Mary Pat still faced doubt from people who couldn't imagine someone as young as her being their representative. Some told her to wait her turn and questioned how she would balance political responsibilities with schoolwork but others were excited by her energy and vision, and she received mail from young people all over the country who were inspired by her campaign. Mary Pat didn't win the race, but she lost by only 22 votes. And she may have scored an even greater victory. Her story inspired a Georgia state senator to write a bill making it a state law that anyone 18 and older can run for office. And Mary Pat says her campaign was just the first of many to come. So that's the story I chose to read. And I just wanted to read another snippet from the back of the book, very short, talking about re things that people can do. And one of these things is have an impact on laws and lawmakers. It says it's easy to feel like you can't make a difference when it comes to something as big and important as laws and politicians but you never know until you try. Any person of any age can write a letter or email, make a phone call, or even pay a visit to their elected representatives. This includes your school board members, city council, the mayor, your state governor, congressional representatives, and even the president. These people are elected to represent you, even if you're too young to vote for them. And I just, before I hand the microphone uh, back over to Kate, just wanted to note that we really saw the truth of that in this legislative session. We went from being a uh, um, state with very little gun violence prevention legislation to enacting a sweeping um, package of reforms. And that happened because of youth, especially young women, showing up in our building nearly every day and pushing for change. And, and I, Representative Jessup and I were in committee room um, hearing incredibly powerful stories and, and real urgency um, from youth who, who just made a huge difference on a number of pieces of legislation. I also had a bill to expand gender-free restroom access in the state. And that bill really got taken up in both the House and the Senate because of youth leadership advocates from outright Vermont who came and testified in committees and, and got that bill moving. Um, so just never doubt the power that youth can have in the legislative process because I think we really saw that in a historic way this year in Vermont. Thank you. And um, speaking of that, um, I do have a stack of uh, postcards, Rad Girls Can postcards that we had made that feature some of the uh, young women from the book. Um, and so we're going to have them um, after our presentation tonight. Um, we have um, actually a voter registration station in the back. If anybody in here um, wants to register to vote, um, can you pre register as a 16 or 17 year old in the state of Vermont? No. You have to be 18. Okay. Although some of us are interested in Can we get a bill? That. Can we get a bill? Thank you. All right. Hope, let's t let's connect afterward. Let's get that going, right? The DMV um, voter registration, everybody who gets their license is automatically opted into voter registration unless they opt out. Excellent. So get your license at age 16 here. Very nice. Excellent. Okay. Um, so, but I will also have postcards afterwards um, with, with the book signing. If anybody wants to write a postcard 
to one of your elected officials. And um, I don't have enough for everybody in here because there's so many of you here. There's more actually oh. at the back. Oh. And I also have um, all the addresses of our legislators, the White House. Fair Pond books, want, everybody. Yeah, yeah. Anything, we will send them for you. So you can leave them with us at the back. There you go. Thank you. Excellent. Um, I be uh, I'm not gonna let you off the hook quite that fast, Selena. Um, I wanted to ask you just a couple questions. Um, again, thinking of what Hope said at the beginning, how, how did you go from having that moment of maybe running for office is something that I want to do to actually deciding to do it? Uh, so I think for me, like a lot of women, I had to be asked. Mm which is really interesting. I had worked on a lot of campaigns. I had worked on, um, started a nonprofit in Vermont on working on reproductive rights issues. I actually grew up in Burlington during Bernie Sanders time as mayor there and was really active in something called the mayor's youth office that, um, Whereas a, a youth, I was able to really experience a lot of engagement in local municipal politics in really meaningful ways. But I had to be asked to run multiple times. I said mm -hmm. no. And um, I think that's true for a lot of women. I remember one of the campaigns that I managed was for a really close friend of mine who ran for city council in Burlington. And she had worked um, for a nonprofit that trained women working in the trades, in carpentry and other um, not traditionally female trades. And she talked about the process that they had to go through um, helping women to understand that they were qualified for some of the jobs that they were being asked to apply for. So women would say, I can't be the four person of a construction job. I I, I don't have the skills, I don't have the experience. And then they would go through a series of questions with them. Well, have you ever supervised a group of people? Well, have you ever managed a carpentry project? And sort of help them to realize, no, wait, actually, I do have these skills and qualifications. And even though that had been part of her professional life, when she stepped up to run, she had to go through that experience of people saying, of her saying, oh, I don't have enough experience. and. People were like, have you worked at every school in the city? Have you worked at every, you know, volunteered for 20 nonprofits in the city? Have you, have you moved um, pieces of policy as an activist? And so I think um, for many of us as women and, and for maybe people who don't experience that and are ready to go, that is really exciting. But uh, I, I had to be asked and I had to convince myself that I was ready, and I'm so glad that I did because hey. it's it's definitely changed my life, and it's given me um, an amazing feeling of being able to contribute and make change in a way that I hadn't before. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here, and thank you for saying yes after people asked you. Um, all right, I'm going to read another story um, from the book. Um, I think this is my first time reading the story out loud by the per people that I'm re uh, reading about are sitting right next to me. Um, no, actually, I read about the radical monarchs, um, and some of them were at our book launch in Oakland. So, but this is my second time. Okay, so I hope it's okay. All right. Um, all right, so this story uh, is about Muslim girls making change, and they were founded in Burlington, Vermont in 2015. And if I get anything wrong, let me know later. Don't correct me if I'm wrong. We can correct in a reprint. <laughs> when 10th grader Hawa Adams saw the flyer in the school hallway for a slam poetry team competition, she knew just what to do. Okay, guys, Hawa told her friends, Kieran, Lena, and Balkisa, we have to prepare something. We have to do this. Did it matter that two of the four girls had never written a poem? And that the other two had only recently discovered slam poetry as a powerful form of expression? No. For four brown-skinned Muslim girls growing up in Vermont, what mattered were the stories they wanted to tell and the emotions that they wanted to convey. Slam poetry is a creative competition. Poets don't just recite their poems. They perform them, and they vie for the highest score. Though any slam poet will tell you it's not about the points, it's about the poetry. The poems are often political and personal and the style of performance tends to be intense and powerful. 
The four friends called their team Muslim Girls Making Change, MGMC, and they worked together for weeks to write their first poem. Wake Up America is about the tragic events of September 11, 2001, and how American Muslims became the targets of suspicion, harassment, and even violence in the months and years that followed. MGMC went to the audition and blew away the judges, who immediately signed them up to represent the state of Vermont at the International Brave New Voices Slam Poetry Competition. Just a few months after the audition, the girls took a 20-hour car ride ooh, to Washington, <laughs> D.C. <laughs> Do you remember that? <laughs> where they became the first all-Muslim team to perform. They didn't win, but they were a huge hit. Hawa, Kira, and Lena, and Balkisa had met at their local Islamic community center, where they bonded over many things, including their shared experiences as Muslim girls in Vermont. Vermont is the second whitest state in America. And while people of any race or ethnicity can be Muslim, the members of MGMC are all brown-skinned. As a result, the girls are constantly asked questions about their identities. They know that many of these questions aren't intended to be offensive, but they get tired of having to explain their own existence. Their poem, Hijab 101, is a humorous but also serious attempt to answer the endless inquiries the girls receive about their hijabs, the traditional Muslim head coverings they all wear every day. The poem is especially powerful for Kiran, who's not here this evening, but she says hi, um, who didn't begin weari wearing her hijab until she was in 10th grade. She wanted to wear it, but in middle school, she just wanted to fit in. She was afraid of looking different and of being judged. She felt proud once she began to wear her hijab to school, and she used her experiences to help craft the poem, which begins with a list of frequently asked questions, such as, aren't you hot in that? Do you shower with that on? What's underneath that thing? Why do you wear that? You were prettier before. Can I see your hair? Does your dad make you wear it? MGMC has perfor have performed their poems all over their home state and beyond, and they've expanded their subject matter as well. They address many contemporary issues and injustices, from police brutality to the ways that immigrants are viewed in America. They also lead poetry and performance workshops where they show other young people how to use poetry to express emotions and experiences that the world needs to hear. And that is our story about Muslim girls making change. And, um, I said earlier that one of the hardest things about the book was kind of knowing when to stop in terms of who to include in the book, but I think another big challenge was um, having to edit these stories down. I had a pretty tight word count. We try to keep the stories on the shorter side um, to give people a little bit of a snippet um, you know, of, of what these people are about. But uh, that means that I have to leave out a lot of really interesting information. So I didn't get, there was a lot about you guys that I wanted to include. You guys performed at the Women's March in Vermont. Um, so many other prestigious things. And also I wrote this before you'd all been accepted. Uh, into fantastic prestigious colleges that you're all going to be attending in the fall. So congratulations. Um, and uh, I'm going to ask a few questions um, and have them share a little bit more about their experiences. But before that, um, you do get to hear a poem. So. Hi, everyone. I'm Lena. I'm Paula. I'm Balkisa. Um, and unfortunately, as I mentioned before, Kieran couldn't join us today. But um, we all we will be performing a poem called Welcome. Um, and oh, no, welcome. Welcome. <laughs> welcome. Uh, and it talks about uh, the Syrian refugee crisis. We have an like, order. We have like an order in every poem. <laughs> into this melting pot. We invite the flavor, the culture, the warmth. Come to the land of the free, to the home of the Whose free. Whose land is this? this? How, How far does your freedom go back? Do you know the names of tribes you stand on? Who decides who stands here? My torch is lit for you. I stand alone in the dark. Come join me. 
Come, my soil is ready for your footprints. I have made this place one for your feet to stop all over the restrictions. Child, come swim in this liquor of liberty. Let me tell you, I fought hard for my freedom. My children are dead. My mother is dead. My father is dead. My family is dead. I am alone. I cannot breathe. Tell me, who is truly welcome here? Lady Liberty, teach us again. I'm still teaching with open arms. Please join me, please hug me, enrich me, truly make this great again. Lady Liberty, you are a bill with broken chains at your feet. You are a gift that tried to erase the memory of a time that brought darker folks. Eyes cloud with heads down, souls broken. Can your people welcome us without owning us? Yes, I am a mother. You are my children, I cannot own my own kin. My family is deeper than countries and boundaries. My bloodline is thicker than oceans. Give me all those who ache to breathe in a space where, not, where they will not be beaten for daring to let their lungs expand. Yes, I want your tired, poor, the ones yearning to breathe free. Child, breathe free. We can't breathe. The walls they talk of building are closing in on us. Where is the freedom to which we about so graciously? Why do you refuse it today when you accepted us yesterday? You are welcome. I invite you who have suffered to enjoy this freedom, to be fed. I'll let you in, have let them in. I held my torch for all to see when they drew close, that their travel had paid off. I'm still prepared for the waves, the currents of people washing onto my beaches. Do you mean the pollution? We are trash. We take up too much space. No one speaks up for us. We are the immigrants who stole your jobs, who built your jobs. Oh, how you forget history. You turned away Jewish refugees and sent them back to Europe, sent them back to the camps they had run from. They were so close, waiting on the beaches of Florida, full of hope. America would save them, you would save them, but we're a threat, aren't we? That justifies it, right? We're spies, a danger to national security. We, we were, we are, scary, scary dangerous, dangerous, foreign. But aren't we all your children? It is time to make amends. Knock, knock. We're, we're here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, one of my favorite stories um, in the book to research and to write actually is a story of Yusra Mardini, who is a Syrian refugee who was a swimmer and trained as a swimmer as a girl and a teenager in Syria. Um, and then the war started and she couldn't train anymore because her pool got bombed. And uh, when she was 18, she and her sister finally were able to escape and they were on a boat of 20 refugees fleeing Turkey, headed to Greece and the boat broke and began to sink. Um, some people may know the story, she dived into the water and swam, she and her sister swam the boat to Greece, to the shores of Greece. It took them over three hours and they saved the lives of every refugee on that boat. Um, they got to Greece, they made it through four different countries. She made it to Germany. First thing she wanted to do was join a swim team, which she did, and she ended up being on the first refugee team in the Olympics in 2016, and she was able to swim in the Olympics. Uh, and she's going to be swimming in 2020, in the Olymp or she's hoping to. She's training to swim. Um, and so thank you for, sh for sharing that particular story. Um, and I know that when I was writing the story of Yusra Mardini in this, for this book, I was researching it about a year and a half ago, um, kind of when the refugee crisis worldwide was, was it feels weird to say peaking, because it's kind of always peaking. <laughs> um, but it was also right after the Muslim ban and... I kn in, in reading that story and knowing that I was going to put it in the, the book, it made me feel this kind of um, hope that like at least I could be knowing that I would include that story of perseverance and such a powerful story of a refugee in the book, which leads me to maybe my first question for you guys. Um, and you don't, you, I think you have loud voices, so you can, I'll, I'll hand you the mic. But um, I'm interested in, um, you began doing this together, sharing, to write poems to share your own personal stories, right? There are things that were very personal about you and your immediate experiences with your identity. 
you've now evolved, you've been working together for several years, and the piece you just performed was very much about speaking in the voices of other people and sharing those stories. I'm just curious to know how you guys came to that. This wasn't, we prepared beforehand. I told them questions I was gonna ask, and I'm just throwing them this curveball because I was really moved, so sorry. Um, but I'm curious, the other ones will all be pre-rehearsed, don't worry, but, um, uh, but I'm really curious to know, like, how did you guys come to decide that you were gonna talk about other experiences, and how does it feel to be, to sh be sharing stories um, of, of other communities who are marginalized and silenced? You always think you're loud, but just, just for just for safety. Okay. Um, so when we first came together back in 2016, um, we didn't know what to write about. We were new to slam poetry. And so obviously the one common diff like common thing that we had in common was um, that we're Muslim. Um, and so, you know, with, the, with everything that was happening around the world, um, Islamophobia was a big thing that we wanted to bring to light. Um, and so we did research um, and we discovered all these like hidden crimes um, and things that injustices that have been happening to Muslims in all different types of communities. Um, and so we realized that we didn't know about these crimes. How would the world know about those? So, and it's, and it's injustice that's happening to people that are exactly like us. So it's important that we bring those to light. So we had to, we had to tell their stories. Um, and then eventually it turned, we incorporated our own stories because of course, our, ours aren't as extreme and are direct, but you know those those microaggressions mattered and they affected us every day. So we wanted to bring our stories to light along with them to kind of like balance it out, I guess. Um, and so I don't know. It's just it's just kind of evolved um, with the pieces, and it's really important that you know even though we're doing like persona poetry, that we're not like taking over somebody's words or taking over their story, and we're just showing it. Um, to the best that we understand it, um, and we do try to understand it fully. Yeah, um, and it's definitely really important to share these stories in order for people to take action. I think it really does start off with having that conversation, but it doesn't stop there. Because if you, it's really important, especially now in this political climate, to take action and to help out uh, people who are facing these issues. And people cannot just stand here and tell their stories and just like, that's the end, you know, like the story doesn't end there. It continues with people getting involved and, and seeing what they can do to help. So I think that's what's really important with sharing other people's stories. Also, like adding on to that, I feel like it's also really important to understand that um, our mission and what we do is so much more than just the four of us talking about our own personal experiences. Um, we've been so blessed and honored to have this privilege, this platform that we've created. And it's it's our duty to talk about like everything else that's going on to give voice to those who are voiceless, who don't have the opportunity to talk about their issues. And so that's what that's what we really try to do. Like we have a poem called Wake Up America, which talks about our personal experiences. But the idea behind that whole poem is talking about what else is happening to other Muslims in the world that we have no idea that's going on. So I feel like our main thing is going beyond the four of us and like talking about everybody else and giving them the opportunity to share their stories and their voice. Um, so, and that actually leads into my next question, which I did tell you I was going to ask. Um, but so speaking of um, moving from hearing about something into action, I actually want to give a quick plug, um, since you, you shared that particular story. Um, if anyone is looking for yet another amazing organization doing incredibly powerful uh, work in the world, um, I just want to shout out the, there's an organization called Circle of Health International that I've done a lot of supporting for. Um, the executive director is in the back. She didn't know I was going to mention her. That's Sarah. Uh, but uh, Circle of Health International is an organization um, that does uh, maternal and reproductive and pediatric health care um, in the war, war zones around the world. And they've been in Syria um, having, um, having clinics in hospitals in Syria for many years. They've been in Haiti. They've been in Puerto Rico. They're also on the U.S.-Mexico border um, giving immediate uh, medical care to people just out of detention centers. Um, they've been training midwives all around the world. Um, and making sure that women and babies and children who are the most vulnerable in these most vulnerable of places um, are cared for and are getting the medical care they need. So it's called Circle of Health International. If you've already given to the ACLU uh, you know, and every other organization, um, 
shout out, Sarah. Thanks for your work. And thanks to you. Um, so that leads me um, to asking you, how do you see, so in this time of activism, and there's so much going on, and how do we raise awareness and get involved? Um, how do you see, what do you see the role of poetry and storytelling um, in activism and awareness um, these days? Um, for me, I feel like poetry has been our outlet to talk about all these issues that we really care about. Um, because through poetry, there's not one right way to write a poem. Like every, it's very unique to the person, very unique to the writer's style. And so um, po just being able to be yourself and use your own unique um, artistic traits to talk about issues that you really deeply care about has been like the reason why we chose um, poetry as a way to do it. It's also because like I love this line that Karen always says. She's like, through poetry, when we're up here and we're talking, nobody can interrupt us, you know? <laughs> so like the floor is really ours. <laughs> and so that's one reason why um, poetry has been our outlet to talk about social justice issues. Yeah, um, and it definitely allows people who are fa facing these issues head on to reclaim their narratives and just just uh, like just bashing on the dangers of a single story um, and allowing politicians to hear these stories so they can do something about it. It really does affect their work and how they can make change about it. Also, for us, it really, how we were inspired was from other youth who were able to use poetry to get involved, to talk about these political issues and I've definitely seen like a lot of my conversations with people become more politically charged and it led to me like figuring out how I can like get connected with them and it helped me like do a lot of networking along with these girls so it does definitely has helped not only just again saying before like not like like I said before not just having these conversations but also getting involved because it's so 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 important and that's something we really really want to shed light on um, so that's why we, we've continued our work for so long, but yeah. Um, I think poetry, like through doing it for so long now, I think the one thing that it's helped like us out with is building communities. So I definitely think that um, there's a lot of different ways that you can reach out to people um, and you can stay in contact with them. But I think poetry has allowed us to get more like, I don't know, more of our youth like more of us and our peers like involved um, and allowed them to kind of like see that there's this new type of um, style of activism um, and it's different, it's not limiting, um, it's very accessible. Um, and so I think it's just a way of just kind of bringing those people together um, in this time where there's so many different like avenues for activism. Um, it's definitely one that I wouldn't have seen myself doing, um, but here I am, so. I think every youth can relate to that eventually when they become part of that community of activists and um, when they become part of this poetry experience because we still stay in contact with people that we met in Washington, D.C., and we still know those guys um, and hit them whenever we want, and poetry is always the one thing that's going to bring us together. Um, and then beyond that, we're all activists separately, and then we're all activists together through poetry. So one more question. Um, speaking of being activists together and then also separately, um, you know, in this book, I write about a lot of individuals who've done remarkable things. And in each of those stories, I try to also really include information about the communities they worked with, right? Because nobody does this stuff alone. So even if I'm writing about one individual person, they all relied on their community, their peers, sometimes their parents, sometimes not at all their parents, sometimes teachers or mentors or coaches. Um, but I also include stories of, of, of groups like you guys and a few other duos and, and groups and, and, and organizations. Um, but you said something um, kind of striking upstairs, which is that working together um, and doing this has actually led you guys to really discover yourselves as individuals. So I wonder, just as a last question, if you could talk about that process. How has working together in a very close-knit way um, where, in fact, you're often speaking in unison, I think, which is really a remarkable aspect of your performance, that you're not just, you're really speaking together, but then how does that let you kind of discover yourselves individually? Um, I like going first, because I know the answers to these questions, and so it's not that hard. But um, <laughs> um, doing this as a group has, like, really changed all of us individually, because I feel like it's so much easier being able to be on stage with my friends by my side talking about these things that matter to us all. I felt like middle school me was like really scared to like raise my hand in class or like 
I was like really closed in and like I wasn't as confident as I am now. Like there's something going on, let's go, we'll handle it type of thing, you know? And so it's a lot easier having them by my side, being able to do it with them and also having them like influence me, inspire me to do better and be better. Cause I feel like there's a lot of things that we all do individually, but the amazing thing is we all get each other involved. We're like, oh, you're doing this. Okay, let's go. Like tomorrow I have this going on. Like we're always like together doing um, the things we do separately. And it just really helped us grow our confidence and just really grow as women. And um, I feel like it's a lot, like it's a lot, it's a lot better having um, them by my side, being able to tell me I can do something in a world that's telling me I can't do something. You know? So yeah. Yes. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like as mentioned before, or uh, as Kisa said, it's definitely been easier to have them by my side not only with my confidence, but also being more comfortable to talk about these issues. And that's generally how our poems start off. You know, like we like start ranting about something and then we're like, okay, wait, wait, what are we doing? Let's write a poem about this. Like we're poets. But it's it's definitely been easier because as Kisa said, I've I've been that kid who's been in the back of the classroom who didn't even want to get up and go sharpen my pencil because it would just like cause too much of a distraction. Mm -hmm. Like that's how bad it was. And I never I never found myself and I, I definitely truly found myself with these girls helping me because and especially with a Brave New Voices when we went there, which was an, which is an international poetry competition we attended. Going there has really shed light on being able to be truly yourself and be unapologetic about that. Because that's so important, especially at, the, at that age, especially living in Vermont and being like a person of color. Like that's so important and, and getting involved and be able to share your story. Um, and like, like we've said before, it's definitely made it easier by, them, by, by having them by my side. Um, yeah, I agree. I think we have this shared experience together um, and being able to continue to evolve and build off of that. Um, with the, with them by my side has made it completely like like just relaxed um and i can go up in front of strangers say whatever i want do whatever i want so um <laughs> yeah i think our first like rehearsal together you know we weren't willing to do that we weren't willing to share anything with each other although we're all like um you know muslim teens same grade everything um, same mosque, but different communities. You know, we have these uh, differences, even though we have like really big similarities as well. Um, you know, I'm we're Somali, uh, Lena's uh, Yemeni and Egyptian, and then Kieran's Pakistani. Um, so we have a lot of cultural differences, as well as just like different preferences on just like anything, movies, books, whatever, <laughs> music <laughs> is key. <laughs> I hated that <laughs> So I think it's allowed me to see that like, yes, I have them um, and I have this Muslim identity with them, but I also have myself and I have my music taste, my, <laughs> my book preferences, and I know what I want to do. Um, and I know I can always count on them to encourage me and continue me into my path. You guys are gonna like walk into college, just like okay, like you're gonna like the first first lecture you're in, you're gonna be like, professor, actually, no. <laughs> um, thank you guys so much. Um, and Selena, will you come? Will you come back and enjoy this here? Um, um, I really love what you said about how no one can interrupt you when you're sharing a poem. I've never thought about it, but that's really when I'm up here reading these stories, I'm like, yeah, no one's gonna interrupt and argue with me. Maybe they'll try afterwards, but it's uh, it's powerful. Um, so thank you all for being people who are using your platform and your position um, of power to do such impactful and truly rad things. Um, people ask me all the time, obviously, like, what does it mean to be rad? Like, what, what does rad mean? Um, and, you know, I, we joke that we use the word rad in our first book because I grew up in Northern California and Miriam grew up in Southern California as like a surfer punk and I grew up as like a Northern California hippie kid and we both used the word rad all the time. It was just like in every other sentence in my childhood and it's kind of still is actually. But, um, but also, you know, rad is just like this eternal word that, mean, wor word that means cool and awesome. But it's also short for radical. Um, and 
we have a lot of negative associations with a radical sometimes, but also to be radical means to be someone who's willing to do something differently, to be the first one to do something, to do something that's never been done, to take a chance or take that step. And the stories that we tell in these books are really about people who've done that, who are willing to run for office, who are willing to get up and do a slam poem, um, who are willing to you know take some step um, to to train, to go after something that they believe in. And so those are the stories that we tell. Um, and thank you guys so much for being here, um, for being so rad. Um, so we have a few minutes. If anybody has questions um, you'd like to ask, yes? Um, do you have any advice um, I, you can just speak loud. I can echo it. So um, as a person who began being a, an activist in high school in New York and then continued to be an activist in uh, Vermont 20 years and then continued in Baltimore the last 20 years where I've been teaching um, English as a second language in a high school working with refugee and immigrant students. What do you do when you have to study for a test and it doesn't seem very interesting or relevant and you have, you know, an activity or, you know, something you need to do that's in the activist basket. What do you tell yourself when you're faced with that I think this one's for you guys. <laughs> so to uh, to paraphrase, so wh what do you do? Like, h how do you prioritize like studying for a test when like the world is burning and you want to go do other things? You're about to go to college, and yeah. <laughs> you want to be involved in activist activities, and that's what's really calling you. Yeah. But you have to study for a biology test, or you know your yeah. social, you know his world history test, and you don't. Think the professor knows what he's talking about. <laughs> you know, you, what do you say to yourself? Yeah, yeah I forget that test. <laughs> no, um, I feel like that's something that we struggled with a lot, especially our junior and our senior year, because that's when, yeah, especially junior year, because we had like performances all the time, like three times a week, and they were like at nighttime and stuff, and just balancing out schoolwork, which was really important to us, but activism, which was so much more important to us, was really, really hard because I feel like I found myself coming from performances at like 11 o'clock at night because they were like a really far distance or something. And like 11 o'clock, I would start studying and be up studying until like 2 a.m., you know? So obviously, I'm not going to stop doing what I really want to do, but I'm also not going to let down my schoolwork and my education because that's also what's keeping me really powerful, you know? And so, um, yeah, it's just finding the time to balance them both out, but um, being able to do what I really love, and then um, I guess losing a couple hours of sleep to do homework. <laughs> yeah, just echoing what Kisa said, really solidifying our time management skills. Um, that has definitely, it's, it's helped. I mean, it's definitely needed in college. Um, but yeah, I, I know like there are times where um, Kieran and I have had a test, like an AP Euro test that we had to study for on our way because we had it the next day, but we were like on our way to our performance and we knew we were gonna come back super, super late. So we were literally studying on our way. So we definitely make it work. We definitely find the time. Um, it's It's been challenging, but I mean like going to college, it's, it's worked, so yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I graduated. That's, I just yeah, updated the wrong day. We got a diploma. <laughs> No, but honestly, I think, yeah, I think, of course, m time management and prioritizing is uh, really important, but it's also really hard to do. So I think the earlier you do it, the better. So I definitely think when we were performing, like, <laughs> three times a day sometimes, that was crazy. Um, like, it was better, it's okay to, like, say no to certain things, and it was really hard for me to learn that um, because I wanted to take so much on. But I think if you learn that early enough, you'll have more time later on to like do more stuff um, that you love to do. So I think just getting that through your head that it's like, okay, if this person just might get a little mad because I can't come to this performance or do this one th project with them, um, it's, it's okay. Because there's gonna be a million other people waiting for you um, that you can please. Um, also, I think, I think you just gotta like take your, I don't know, take, your, take it day by day. 
Uh, it's really exhausting, um, but it's gonna like pay off later on. And there's just like so many other people that are going through it that you can definitely like talk to um, to help you kind of like get through like that stress. Um, I know we, we even though we had homework, we still like hit each other up. Was like, hey, did you do that homework? Cause I didn't. <laughs> uh, so just like find people that can help you calm down a little bit. So it's like the uh, it's like the classic activist struggle, right? Like, yeah. how do you destroy capitalism under capitalism? Sorry. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, first off, thank you to all our music. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm really glad you're here. Um, I'm so glad that you all have found your voice and you're sharing it with us. I'm a middle school teacher, so um, and I heard a lot about you talking about your middle school years and just that they were difficult, and probably for people like you uh, research. And I was just wondering if you had any advice for how to Mm -hmm. So uh, the question comes from a middle school teacher, and it's about you know kind of the best way to help women and girls, um, and I would say young boys as well yeah. to find to find their voice um, and and that confidence um, as as early as possible. Um, yeah, any uh, any tips? I'd say I guess allowing them to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Uh, I think that's something we've definitely had to face um, and learn the hard way because I know in middle school, like like I've said before, we've never used our voices. But just exposing them to these, these related issues and allowing them to have these conversations with their peers is super crucial, even though it, it might, be able, might be a little uncomfortable. Um, I think that's how you get the best conversations going, and that's how you learn the most. Um, I think that's, that's a good start, but... Um, personally, from working with middle schoolers, like we've done workshops with middle schoolers around like poetry and getting them to um, express their voices and their opinions and stuff. Um, I've realized we, they just don't have the platform or the opportunity or the space in a classroom or somewhere to talk about those things, you know? Because I feel like a lot of the times we think, oh, they're just kids, like they're still young, like they have no idea what's going on, but like. Honestly, the poems these like guys were writing, girls and guys were writing, were so amazing. Like we thought we were good. Like they were so amazing, and um, and they have a lot to say, a lot to talk about. So just giving them the opportunity to talk about it, whether that's listening to them or giving them time in class, and just being there for them and just letting them express themselves. Yeah, yeah I think yeah, this is. I think that's really key. Um, I actually did like a a keynote with Karen about this, about like how to how to kind of combat adultism, but I think, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it exists, guys. <laughs> but um, I think you really have to meet them halfway, so I, I think it's important that you, because um, I think most of these students, like Bautista was saying, already have, already have these things in mind, already know what they can, can and, and are able to, like, say. Um, they just need the space to do it. Um, they just need accommodations, you know. It was really important to me when I was getting into the activism scene that there was transportation wherever I went. There was some kind of like, I don't know, stipend type of thing. Um, anything that just shows that like they're appreciated and it's and you can make it possible for them to have these spaces to speak up and talk about what they care about. Because they do care. I have two middle schoolers who have seen you all perform, daughters, and I think also having experiences like that for middle schoolers who can see, you know, what they're not quite peers, but um, what what young people are capable of is a, you all are total rock stars to my kids, and you're very inspiring to them. But you also make them feel like a sense of possibility about what they can do. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're going to get a biased answer because uh, you've got a lot of writers up here. But like my answer to that is like creative writing in the classroom or the arts in the classroom. People express themselves in a lot of different ways. And when you are at that particular middle school age, 
saying what you're feeling and thinking is it's hard enough for us at any age but at that age in particular I've taught creative writing for like 20 years I've taught worked with tons of middle schoolers and the most transformative stuff I've seen in classrooms is when we do creative writing when we do poetry short stories um, any kind of creative work in the classroom you could bring it in in any subject um, it's so many different ways there's so many books out there to kind of help you figure out how to do it and I think that can get people to express themselves um, and share in ways that um, you, you just don't normally get. I didn't get it until I was in high school, any kind of creative writing in the classroom, and that's what made me want to be a writer. So, yes. Hi, I'm Henry. Hi, Henry. Um, so, I'm someone who really believes that young people, and especially youth of color, should be at every leadership table, every strategic table, trying to figure out how to get us out of this mess. Um, I don't want to be like cup half empty kind of person, but to me, uh, you know, voting is really strong, but it's kind of like a cup uh, one three hundred and sixty fifth full, right? Because it happens on one day. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, y'all, you know, what is your strategic sort of orientation to that? Are y'all feeling really strong about that, or what? What else could we be doing all together to fill up that mm -hmm. mass action cup and you know collaboratively? doing the other 364 days of the year. Mm -hmm. yeah. Speaking of that one special voting day, I do believe you guys have a primary coming up next Tuesday, right? Am I right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Um, act, yes, activism tips? Yeah. Oh my God, hope. Oh my God. Yeah, 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 I'm sorry. Um, I will give uh, one quick answer to that. Um, and, you know, I try, so I do this group called Solidarity Sundays. Um, we have chapters all over the country. We meet once a month in person to take practical, meaningful political action. But we also do a lot of stuff um, online. I try to share um, and, ins and, and get people to do creative, frequent action, things that are very doable, right? You can write a letter to the editor. You can, you know, make your phone calls, send your emails. You can make a sign and put it in your car, in your window, right? Like, there's just, like, so many different things we can do. And write, well, you know, <laughs> how do we say? In the wake of the horrible disaster of 2016, there have been some positive things that have happened, right? Such as, like, there are so many great organizations out there that are putting out every day actions, things you can do, ways you can act, right? There's a great thing called Rogan's List. If people, I love Rogan's List, R-O-G-A-N apostrophe S. It's run by a woman who I think is a librarian and she's got a team and they compile concrete information and actions that you can do every day. There's an organization called Daily Action. You can get text messages from them. You can go to their Facebook group. Uh, Indivisible has stuff, has stuff that you can do every day. So getting into that habit, I think is really crucial. Um, I just have another quick plug. Um, so I'm part of this uh, group called Results, always as well. But I'm in charge of the um, US poverty chapter. And so I'm working on recruiting more people to get involved. And as you know, the um, farm bill um, that has passed in the House um, has made drastic changes to SNAP. Um, and millions and millions of people will not be able to ac um, access that, which is terrible. And so um, this group is definitely working on taking action, uh, meeting with our members of Congress, um, and just allowing them to vote no on this farm bill. Um, so if you guys want to get involved, definitely contact me. Um, you can talk to me afterwards. But yeah. Um, I think the most important thing is just like really getting involved because there's so much amazing organizations out there, so much amazing people doing the work. And when there's like two people doing the work, it's a lot better than one person getting it done. And um, yeah, just even if it's like helping voting on voting day or just like whatever it is, just being involved, I feel like getting involved and doing the work is really, really important because other people, like your kids are watching you get involved, your students are watching you get involved, your peers are watching you get involved. So by you taking the first step, you're leading everybody else too. Um, I just, I don't know, I think it's ridiculous that you wouldn't find anything to do because <laughs> there's, there's, it's like, the least that you could do, or like the bare minimum, is stay informed. Yeah. So, and you can do that through any sort of social media platform, basic news channels, anything. That, like, that's, that's the bare minimum. And then the rest is up, up to you. So you kind of have to decide, do I go through it through nonprofit work? Do I get involved um, by working with young youth and 
Do I do it through writing? Whatever it is, um, that's for you to like take on and you to decide what you want to do. So there's never nothing that you can't do. I mean, the easiest thing that you could probably do is also just tweet something. Like that has made numerous changes in the world um, that as we saw from the uh, <laughs> just last election, huh? Or yeah, just stay informed. That's that's the biggest um, help that you can contribute. I think there are a lot of ways to get involved and you can even just Google something. Like just think of an issue that you care about and find a way, whether it's in your local community or even nationally, to become involved in it and to lobby for it or um, phone bank or canvas for it or even just have an art project. Like there are just so many ways to be involved and if you can't find something in your community, then create it. And I think that... I think that ties back to the why I started the Race Against Racism too is because I wanted, like what you mentioned before, I wanted visibility in my community um, for the fight for racial justice and I wanted it to be public and big and so I started it and yeah. There you go. All right, so there's your answer. Just do something and if it's not happening, just start it. Um, all right, um, so I'm sure there are many, many more questions we could ask our wonderful folks, but um, I know you guys have like things to do, and maybe you want to buy a book. Um, <laughs> great. Um, so um, I will, I'm going to be up here signing books. Um, our wonderful, maybe you guys would be willing to sign a book if people wanted you to. Um, and um, I really want to thank um, Bear Pond Books for having all of us. Um, this is a wonderful bookstore. I'm glad you exist. Um, um, I, I'm definitely preaching to the choir here, but please continue to support your local independent bookseller. It's very important. And wait, before you go, I have a plug for one book for the grown-ups. Um, because we've really been talking a lot about racial justice, um, for the grown-ups in the audience, I really want to recommend the book White Fragility. Do you have White Fragility by Robin DiAngelo? Okay. If you have White Fragility by Robin DiAngelo, um, White grown-ups, that's your homework. Um, thank you so much to everybody for coming. Uh, thank you to Muslim Girls Making Change. Thank you, Selena Colburn. Thank you, Hope, for giving us hope. <laughs>